Gentlemen, uh, and a warm welcome. It is unlikely uh, to have escaped the notice of anybody here that um, 200 years ago yesterday, the Battle of Waterloo was fought in Belgium under the overall leadership of the Duke of Wellington with the help of German, Dutch, Belgian uh, uh, forces and our Prussian allies uh, and uh, freed Europe from the grip of the French dictator and emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Uh, this was a historic battle with the outcome awaited with trepidation all over the continent across which Napoleon had waged war for some 15 years and after it was all over tourists flocked to the battleground and among the most distinguished was Sir Walter Scott. Tonight we are very fortunate to have to tell us a great deal more about that uh, visit Lord Woolman or as he prefers to be known Stephen Woolman. Um, uh, Stephen's one of our most distinguished jurists in Scotland and a judge in our highest courts. He was a Harrieter but, uh, we, but, uh, and studied law at Aberdeen before he began his career as a legal academic lecturing at Edinburgh. He's been a counsel to a number of public bodies and he was appointed a Queen's Counsel in 1998 before his elevation to the bench. Stephen, you're most welcome to the yeah. club. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let us draw our minds back, and let us draw our minds back 200 years to the streets of Edinburgh. Walter Scott went out from his home that morning, it was very close to here, when he noticed that the church bells were all ringing and that the public abroad in the streets was rejoicing. And he quickly learned the cause. The news of the Battle of Waterloo had arrived in Edinburgh. It was Friday the 23rd of June, 1815. So this was a momentous event quickly, the official news came via the London Gazette Extraordinary. It contained Wellington's famous dispatch telling His Majesty the course of the battle and in particular singling out what had happened at Hougamont on the battlefield. It also uh, had, with the emissary that brought the message, the dispatch, the two captured eagles. And you'll recall that Napoleon regarded the eagles as absolutely precious and vital. So to bring Napoleon's two eagles to Britain was a very significant event. Walter Scott was energized by this news. He quite quickly became involved in the Waterloo subscription for the dependence of those killed or injured in the battle. And he spoke at a great dinner here in Edinburgh uh, in support of the Waterloo subscription. In fact, he wanted to go to the continent straight away but he couldn't do so because his ward, Miss McLean Clefane, was about to get married. And she was marrying Earl Compton on the 24th of July. So he had to put off his plans for the trip for a few weeks. Before we come to the trip, Let's just examine Walter Scott's reasons for going abroad. The first was a letter, and the letter was sent by a distinguished surgeon, Sir Charles Bell, who'd gone straight to Brussels. And Sir Charles's brother was a well-known jurist, George Joseph Bell, a friend of Walter Scott's. 
And George saw Walter Scott and said, look, this is what my brother says is the position in Brussels. And in his letters, Walter Scott says, this epistle set me on fire. Of course, Walter Scott had never been abroad, but what he firmly believed and repeated many times in the course of his life was that no other age had witnessed so many, so rapid and such profound vicissitudes as his own. He was anxious to be part of the great events that were unfolding. Of course, he was absorbed by Napoleon Bonaparte, the sheer magnetism of the man, the fact that he was the talisman of the new age. But I want to suggest that it went further than that. In some ways, they had interlocking lives, or at least there were parallels that could be drawn between their two lives. They shared a birthday, August the 15th. They were born two years apart, Napoleon in 1769, Scott in 1771. Both were solitary at times as children. Both aspired to be writers. You'll recollect that Scott's first collection was the Border Minstrelsy. Napoleon carried a traveling library with him. And he always had Ossian with him and said, I like Ossian for the same reason that I like to hear the whisper of the wind and the waves of the sea. Both men were interested in martial matters. And of course, Napoleon and the French Revolution had had a profound effect on life in this country and in Edinburgh. Let me just give you one small example. Charles, the Count of Artois, and the brother of King Louis XVIII, lodged at Holyrood from 1794 onwards. <laughs> Scott regarded the Count as one of the most elegant men that he ever saw. At that moment, Walter Scott was at the zenith of his career. The three great poems were in the past. The Lay of the Last Minstrel, 1805, Marmion, 1808, Lady of the Lake, 1810. He was famous for those works. Of course, he was not famous for Waverley, 1814, or Guy, Guy Mannering, 1815, but he knew himself that he was the author of those great works that had achieved such, such renown in the realm. So I believe that he had a profound conviction that he should be at the epicenter of events. In this talk, what I'm going to do is to share 10 scenes from the trip, some short, some very short, to give you vignettes of what happened during the course of the trip. So I begin with the departure on the 28th of July. With him in the carriage were three companions. There was John Scott, who's commonly called Gala. John Scott was a neighbour of Walter Scott's and a relation. Everyone describes him as a cosmopolitan and amusing man. And subsequently he wrote his own account of the tour. There were then two much younger advocates, Alexander Pringle and Robert the Bruce and Robert Bruce. <laughs> Robert Bruce was the son of a fellow clerk in the court of session of Walter Scott. And later, Robert Bruce, that's the son, became the sheriff of Argyle for some 33 years. Walter Scott said to them at the outset of the trip, don't mention my name. 
he didn't want to attract attention. His interest was, at least at the outset, to travel incognito and just witness all he could. They all carried pistols. It was still an excitable time, and so it was wise to be prudent and take uh, precautions by way of having uh, weapons with you. My second scene or section, I'm going to call the journey to Brussels. Walter Scott was in very high spirits in the carriage as it traveled through the borders. He had lots of anecdotes which he uh, meted out to his companions about the civil law class at Edinburgh University, about his time as a young advocate in the outer house. When they got south, they visited the cathedrals of Lincoln and Peterborough. And when in Cambridge, they stayed at the Sun Tavern opposite Trinity College. The crossing went from Harwich, two days, miserable, captain drunk. And they arrived at Bergen op Zoom, where Scott took a great interest in what had happened the year before. Because the year before, General Sir Thomas Graham had tried to carry it by storm. And that was of particular interest to Scott because he'd been given the freedom of the city of Edinburgh on the same day at the same ceremony as the general, just a few months before he mounted the assault. On the 6th of August, the party arrived in Antwerp. That was the first time that they saw English soldiers. They went to inspect the great basins constructed by Napoleon because he had intended to make Antwerp his northern arsenal. There was one other destination within Antwerp for Scott and that was the tomb of Rubens. Scott very much liked Rubens' paintings and particularly his depiction of horses and hunting scenes. But while they, they that is Scott and his party, saw the tomb, they didn't see any of Rubens' paintings. They had all been removed from Antwerp to Paris by the Napoleonic armies. <coughs> the next day, that's Antwerp, the 6th of August. The next day, Brussels, the 7th of August. Gala described the city. I'm using the term Gala, just it's easier to say Gala rather than John Scott and get confused with Walter Scott. Gala described the city as being in the utmost confusion and bustle. Troops horses and wagons, constantly moving about, and the place one vast hospital. He noted that the enthusiasm of the French prisoners who were brought into the town was unshaken and their ferocity unsubdued. Scott spoke to Brussels citizens and they told him that they had awaited the outcome of the battle in agony. And the reason they were in agony is that Napoleon, confident of victory, had promised to take revenge on Brussels. And any moment on the 18th of June, they were expecting a great force to descend upon them. There was one other personage, the first possibly great personage of the trip that Scott met in Brussels. And that was the Duchess of Richmond. She is described, you may have seen in a letter to the Times this morning, as being domineering. I can't say whether she was formidable or not. But what I can say, and we all know, is that she was the hostess 
at the most famous ball in history, the ball on the eve of the Battle of Waterloo. And so she was able to give Scott an instant account of all that had happened, the Gordon Highlanders doing flings, and the news arriving that Napoleon had crossed into the Low Countries. And you recollect what then happened. Wellington went to the Duke of Richmond and said, Sir, have you got a good map? Three, Waterloo. The party set off at daybreak on the 9th of August. It was a beautiful day and they drove through a beech forest said to be part of the Forest of Ardennes, immortalised in As You Like It. On arrival, they breakfasted at the same inn that Wellington had used as his headquarters before the battle. What of the battlefield? Now, I need to, to pause here, ladies and gentlemen, and tell you two things. One, when I conceived this talk, I thought I would use visual aids. When I had finally completed it, I thought I wasn't really going to use visual aids. So I will have some slides, like this slide of the battle, but I'm not really going to focus on them to any great degree. The second thing is this. I did not do French at school. It's my confession. So when I mangle French names in the course of the rest of the talk, I either shout out the correct pronunciation or excuse me. So, the battlefield, and we see the battlefield there. All these slides, very kindly and helpfully, have come from the National Library of Scotland, who have been quite wonderful in assisting me. Scott said, The battlefield is scarcely two miles long, and not above half a mile in breadth. He found the ground torn by the shot and shells, broken up, and rutted with the wheels of the artillery. It's been estimated, well, there are various estimates, but one estimate has the number of slain exceeding 30,000, and there being 12,000 dead horses. But can I remind you of this? In the 21 years of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain lost one third of the men who fell on one day at the Battle of the Somme in 1916. In the course now this slide perhaps give you gives you the best illustration of what the battlefield looked like when Scott arrived. This is a painting done in late July, just a matter of perhaps a week before Walter Scott arrived. And you'll see there are some people there, tourists perhaps there already. There's a, a, a line of country, uh, sorry, a road running through the, the centre of the, the, the uh, painting. But all rather nondescript. To assist him and his friends, Walter Scott, Scott secured the services of Captain Campbell. Now, Captain Campbell was the aide-de-camp to General Adams. General Adams was the injured son of his close friend and judge in Scotland, Chief Commissioner Adam. General Adams had commanded the 3rd Brigade that had played a decisive role in defeating the Imperial Guard. There was also Major Gordon, and Major Price Gordon had also participated. So these two men were able to give Scott very close and helpful information about the course of the battle. And there you get an idea there of the cannon shot going through the roof of the, the building at Waterloo. But perhaps paradoxically, the person who made the biggest impression on Scott, or seemingly did so, was a fraudster. At one stage he claimed to have been a French officer who had deserted to Britain on the morning of the battle, 
It seemed he was just a local innkeeper who'd picked up information by hearsay and was retelling it to everyone who would listen. And Scott listened. After hearing the account of the battle, Scott moved off on his own and he stood looking at the battlefield with rapt attention. He described it later as a scene of horrid magnificence. He noted as he wandered around that some of the French cannon were embossed with ins the inscriptions liberty, egality, fraternity. Others bore the names of philosophers, Voltaire, Rousseau. He went to where Wellington had stood. He saw the tree where Wellington had stationed himself with the marks where the cannonballs had struck, which had been aimed at him. Later, that tree was cut down and sent to the furniture maker Thomas Chippendale, who made three chairs out of the tree. One went to the Prince Regent, one to the Duke of Wellington, and one to the Duke of Rutland. Because he had read Wellington's dispatch, Scott spent about two hours beside Hougamont. He then went to the more sheltered ridge at La Belle Alliance from where Napoleon had observed the battle. And he said that's where he felt most deeply connected to the battlefield. He said he was oppressed with sensations that he was standing where a man had stood who so long held the highest place in Europe. Then there came to be the question of mementos. Really all the valuable items had already been filched by the time that Walter Scott and his party arrived, but there were still boots, papers, all sorts of things littering the battlefield. Flemish peasants have generally been blamed for carrying out the pillaging, but it seems more likely now that it was actually soldiers who carried out most of the desecration and in particular you may know that there is there came to be a, a commodity known as waterloo teeth so many teeth were taken from the fallen and then used for dentures for those all over britain that it was uh, a mark of uh, some distinction to have waterloo teeth walter scott bought two large French cuirasses. One's now at Abbotsford in the hall. You'll see it with a bullet hole through it. He gave the other to his friend and relation, the Duke of Buclou. He bought a grand cross of the Légion d'Honneur. But his most precious item came to him from Major Gordon's wife. And she gave him a manuscript of songs, French songs, and it was stained with blood and clay, and it came from the hand of a young French officer who died in the battle. So ladies and gentlemen, this was, it's sometimes said that he was the first battlefield tourist. That's perhaps making light of what must have been a very profound experience. Four, Brussels to Paris. On his way to Paris, the party, or on their way, they stopped at Mons to see where Mons Meg had been made. And there's this anecdote which Scott relates about something he saw on the way to Paris. He said, I saw an old Frenchman in full costume sitting on a bench with a Prussian soldier on one side smoking a long pipe and an English soldier on the other side with a glass of brandy. The Frenchman cast his eyes from time to time on his two extraordinary companions, shrugging his shoulders and uttering deep groans. Paris, this is five. These were febrile times in Paris. 
there was extreme heat that August. A million troops were collected in the city. And there was a collection of notables. The Tsar, the King of Prussia, the Emperor of Austria, the King of France, the Duke of Wellington and the generals. A whole clutch of diplomatists. Scott remarked that an English drum had not been heard in Paris since 1436, when the troops of Henry VI had been expelled. Tension was high throughout the visit. On the 15th of August, you'll recollect that's the birthday of Scott and Napoleon, high mass was celebrated at Notre Dame Cathedral in the presence of the French royal family. It was expected that the mob might be unruly but no discontent was disclosed or shown. At one stage, Scott said that he wanted to see the guillotine. And uh, he got so busy with other matters that he didn't see the guillotine, but he came, across, he, he came to uh, know his compatriot, James Simpson, while they stayed in Paris. And James Simpson went and found the guillotine what he called the murderous instrument behind a coach house door. So let's just talk generally about Scott in Paris. He led a very active and busy social life. He went to the theatre most nights and said that he found Moliere very fine. He told his wife in a letter that he went to the very best restaurants and drank a bottle of champagne or burgundy every day, rather than porter. He went to the bookshops. There were many cruel caricatures of Napoleon, and Scott bought some of them. He also bought the most popular print of the day, Highland Soldiers on a Windy Day. So what did he do and the party do on day one when they arrived? After depositing their belongings in their hotel, they went straight to the Louvre to see the looted works of art. And it was just as well they did, because by the time they finished their trip, 300 masterpieces had been repatriated. So had the Venetian bronze horses. So Scott saw the, the Venetian horses, so famous from St. Mark, it's not really St. Mark's Square, around the corner. That uh, uh, he saw them in Paris on a triumphal arch before they were taken back. Later on the first day, they went to the most celebrated cafe of the day in the Palais Royal. This was the Cafe de Mille Colons, and it was a cafe which Napoleon not only put patronized, but insisted that his spies go to because the quality of the gossip was so excellent. Before uh, Scott went, the night before, King Friedrich of Prussia was there. Now, there is a, an assertion, and I can't find the basis for it, but there is an assertion that Scott fell madly in love with the beautiful matron who presided over the cafe, who was known as La Belle Luminadier. Nice to think that he had that little romantic excursion, but we know no more about it. But I think what would be useful now is to just remind ourselves what Scott looked like then, August 1815. And we have a remarkable pen portrait. And the pen portrait comes from Francis Lady Shelley. Now, Lord and Lady Shelley were great friends of the Duke of Wellington. And Lady Shelley was a great horsewoman. And in fact, Wellington asked her to accompany him on some of the parades that took place. So here is Francis Lady Shelley's description of Walter Scott. His first appearance was not prepossessing. A club foot, white eyelashes, and a clumsy figure. Nor did he have any expression when his face was in repose. But upon an instant, some remark will lighten up his whole countenance, 
and you discover the man of genius. Six, the Duke of Wellington. Scott met the Duke very early one morning and found him distinguishingly civil to me. He wrote to his wife that he is the most plain and downright person you ever knew. Young officers in the streets ached his nonchalance and his coolness of manner. But later, these verdicts were slightly revised because Scott told James Ballantyne back in Scotland that he had seen and conversed with all classes of society, from the palace to the cottage, and he had only ever felt awed and abashed in the presence of one man, the Duke of Wellington. Seven, the Duke of Wellington's ball. Perhaps the greatest event, the most signal occasion during the course of the whole trip was the ball held by the Duke of Wellington at his residence, now the British Embassy in Paris. The foreign generals were to be uh, honoured. The Order of the Bath was to be bestowed on Blucher, who was in the highest spirits, talking with much glee to several ladies. When Scott saw Blucher meet the Duke at the ball, he said, a few weeks ago, these two men delivered Europe. The status that Scott had is perhaps best demonstrated by the fact that at supper, at the ball, he was placed beside the Duke. There were only two other people at the table. Lady Caroline Lamb, yes, the Lady Caroline Lamb, and Lady Frances Wedderburn Webster. Both had had intrigues with Byron. Both are alleged to have had intrigues with the Duke. We are told that it was a very merry crew. Much of the mirth stemming from Scott, whom, as we know, was a brilliant raconteur. The Duke described him as a very agreeable man. Scott said to the Duke, or asked him, did you actually see Napoleon during the course of the battle? The Duke replied that he had not, but at one time, from repeated shouts of Vive les Empereurs, thought he must be near. Eight, the Russians. There were two Russians with whom Scott had interesting encounters. The Tsar and General Platov. The Tsar, noticing Scott, had a limp and was wearing the uniform of the Edinburgh Volunteer Cavalry, cavalry and it thought that he'd been injured on active service. And Scott found it very difficult to dissuade him of this notion. <laughs> General Platov took a complete shine to Scott. And when he met him in the street, dismounted from his horse, threw the reins to a Cossack, went up to Scott, embraced him, kissed him on both cheeks, ran back to his horse, mounted, and rode away. There was a great Russian review on the 31st of August in the Place de Concorde. Wellington rode his famous horse, Copenhagen, and uh, the great and the good stood at the very spot where Louis XVI uh, uh, had been uh, publicly beheaded. I think I was missing a sheet, but I found it again. <laughs> Interestingly, only a couple of hundred Frenchmen turned out for this great Russian spectacle. It was probably just too humiliating to witness the conquerors in your home capital city. Let me mention a few incidents in Paris. So this is number nine, section nine. Scott became particularly friendly with Lady Alvanley and her daughters, and on one excursion, they went from Malmaison to Saint-Cloud 
in other words, from Josephine's to Napoleon's favourite residence. And that led uh, Scott to notice how Napoleon had laid out his, or how the building's cabinet was laid out. And he obtained plans, which he subsequently used for the gallery and concealed staircase at Abbotsford. A ghostly supper party. At one supper, Scott was speaking with Lord Castlereagh and Colonel Stanhope. They both fervently believed in ghosts. In Lord Castlereagh's case, he said, as a boy, he'd seen a ghost in the barracks at Ballyshannon. The face of a radiant boy came out of the fireplace and approached him. When he stepped forward, it receded and then faded away. Later, both men, Lord Castlereagh and Colonel Stanhope, both committed suicide, and Scott speculated whether their belief in ghosts disclosed an aberration of the mind. Another incident, Versailles, 27th of August. Scott accompanied Lady Castlereagh for what he called an immense to-do. And the immense to-do involved a huge crowd witnessing all the fountains at Versailles bursting into, into stream. They thought there was maybe 1,000 streams. On the final night, Lord and Lady Castlereagh had a reception, and present as well as Scott was Canova. It's not known whether Scott and Canova actually met, and the reason that Canova was there was because Lord Castlereagh had asked them to go to London to give his opinion on the Elgin marbles. There was a great dispute then, as now, about the marbles, but then some people said they were rubbish. Chunk, they called them. But Canova, when he eventually did get across, thought that they were great art. 10. The return to the United Kingdom. They departed Paris on the 9th of September. When the boat carrying them arrived at Brighton, Scott was carried ashore on the shoulders of burly men. He repaired straight to London and went repaired straight to John Murray in Albemarle Street in the hope of seeing Lord Byron. But Lord Byron wasn't there. Later that evening, Byron came to Scott's Hotel, Long's Hotel. You will recollect that Byron was then 27 years of age. One of the party was Charles Matthews, a comedian and mimic of some repute. He later told his wife that Byron was the only man to whom he felt disposed to apply the word beautiful. During the course of that evening, Scott was the principal talker and he gave a very detailed account of the tour and the remarkable scenes and persons that he'd come across. Seven months later, Byron left the country he, of course, unlike Scott, was a great supporter of Napoleon, and he travelled on the continent in a replica of Napoleon's coach. Scott left London on the 14th of September and arrived back at Abbotsford on the 24th of September. So, from the departure at the end of July to the arrival at the end of September, it was a two-month trip. Here are my reflections on that trip. There were tangible ones. One of them was the Field of Waterloo and the proceeds from the sale of the Field of Waterloo, which was a great success at the time, went to the Waterloo Subscription Fund. These scenes are the prints which accompanied, which were part of the first edition. So the purchasers were not just getting the stanzas, they were getting these very colourful, powerful images of what had happened in the battle.
critics were not so kind. The great liberal lawyer, Lord Erskine, is said to have been the author of this squib. How vast the heaps of prostrate slain, on Waterloo's immortal plain, yet none by sabre or by shot fell half so flat as Walter Scott. <laughs> so one tangible result was the poem The Field of Waterloo. Another tangible result was Paul's letters to his kinsfolk, and that was a great success too, with both the first and the second editions selling out. The third tangible benefit came much later. The magisterial life of Napoleon Buonaparte, as Scott styled it, was published in 1827. Scott remained focused on Napoleon for the rest of his life. But let me just tell you this footnote about the life of uh, Napoleon. When Scott was staying in Paris, Admiral Sir Pulteney Malcolm was staying in the same hotel. Later, he commanded the squadron that blockaded St Helena, and he gave information to Scott about the final chapter of Napoleon's life. What about the intangible benefits? What I want to suggest is that it stimulated Scott inordinately. The impressions that he secured during the course of that trip animated many scenes and many characters in his later works of prose. He said at a dinner in Melrose when he came back, never was a battle more remarkable both of the importance of its results and for the theme and valour of the combatants. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to finish with a, an extract from a poem. And it is not The Field of Waterloo. It is another poem that Scott wrote in 1815 called The Dance of Death. And it seems to me to capture the essence of Scott passion, interest in valour, and the interest in romance. And he wrote, this is just one stanza from it. Wheel the wild dance, while lightnings glance, and thunders rattle loud, and call the brave to bloody grave, to sleep without a shroud. Thank you. That was remarkable, I must say. Quite fascinating. I think if anybody had dropped a pin during it, I'm sure we would have heard it, even on this carpet. Uh, it was clear, concise, and utterly fascinating. Thank you very much indeed. I hope, uh, ladies and gentlemen, that that has stimulated some thoughts in your minds. Um, and I'm sure that Stephen would be glad to uh, respond to any comments or questions you have. Do we know the reasons why Sir Walter Scott's wife didn't accompany him? I, 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 do, I don't. I imagine, she, I mean, she's French, so you might have imagined that she would go. But perhaps she was looking after the children back at home. But it's an interesting question. I don't know the answer. Um, you said when uh, Scott was in Paris that the caricatures of Napoleon were available, yeah. presumably not very complimentary ones. Very uncomplimentary. Yeah. I mean, was Scott interested in the attitudes of Parisians towards Napoleon at this stage after his defeat? Does he make any comments about that? Yes, he, he, he was always very keen to go out in the streets and just anonymously collect the comments of the citizenry. So um, he, was, he says, uh, I think it's reported in Lockhart, that he um, was quite surprised that this great man had been brought so low in the eyes of the Parisians who had been his great champions. Mm -hmm weeks before. Do I see another? Yes, yes. Yeah, oh, sir, from right. The, yes. Yes, yes, Eric. Sir, mm -hmm. wonderful. Uh, may I say further to the lady's comment there just now about um, the take of the Parisians. 
Um, in those days when you didn't have the TV and satire and the media as we now know them, um, there was a terrific industry um, in um, uh, satirical prints. Uh, and I've got you be present in the back row here from the British Museum. Uh, at this very moment, um, there's about a two-month exhibition of uh, wonderful scatological um, <laughs> takes on both Napoleon and the farting British um, <laughs> blowing the wind back across the channel for the whole era. So there's wonderful things to share about the whole of Britain was wholly um, just gripped by the whole conflict and the final resolution. Uh, so that's one thing. But sublime to ridiculism back again. Can you tell us a wee bit? Because I was just most interested there, you said, the visit uh, to the battlefield was 1815 August, but you didn't bring out the great life of Bonaparte until 1827. Um, from I think there's a lot of experts in here. Did Walter Scott keep uh, much in the way of notes at the time? And how do we know it took so long? Because he had a hell of an industry on the go all the time. But it was 12 years later before he did the great nine volumes. Of uh, Mil a million words, I think. Yes, indeed. Right. So, uh, small about notes of these, what notes he took in 1815 about his trip. Thanks, Eric. Yes, Eric, he, he took lots of notes, and he used them as the basis of Paul's letters to his kinsfolk, and so he had them. But I think he was embarked, he just really embarked on his novel writing career, and that had taken off to such a marked mm -hmm. degree that that occupied, or that's where he placed his resources, and he only later came back to Napoleon. Buonaparte, I still like Buonaparte. <laughs> I, I don't see anybody trying to catch my eye, so uh, I don't feel up to the task. May I ask Sheriff Andrew Bell to say a word uh, on our behalf of thanks to uh, Stephen Baldwin. Mr Chairman, uh, members of the club and guests, uh, I'm sure, as, as the chairman has already said, we were all absolutely enthralled by this. I was a little, I was a little mystified by why the chairman introduced uh, our speaker by saying he was a Harrieter. <laughs> However, he's uh, called upon me to redress the balance as one who went to the same school as Sir Walter. Uh, my only connection personally with the Battle of Waterloo is uh, that I met uh, the lady that became my wife, whom I haven't brought either tonight, uh, in the inside New York pub on the, in the Royal Mile. <laughs> I don't, there's a story, of course, that uh, uh, told by Sir Donald Tovey, I think, that uh, uh, there was a lady who objected to the fuss that was then being made about the music of Henry Purcell, and she said she didn't think very much of it, and she thought Purcell was merely a pale imitation of Handel. When it was pointed out that that was impossible, because uh, Purcell died when Handel was six. Uh, she said, oh, if you're going to bring dates into the battle, then I said, no, nothing more to say. So I, I don't want to be accused of bringing dates into this battle, but uh, not only did uh, Napoleon and uh, Wellington were born on the same day, but as uh, Stephen has pointed out to us, uh, Scott was born uh, two years later, uh, and Beethoven was born in the year in between, and you might say that Beethoven and Scott in Norway were the great harbingers of, the, of romanticism, uh, and therefore it's a very interesting fact. Uh, but I, I, I like to think of analogies between Scott and, and, and Wellington. They were both, of course, very much supporters of the Tory party uh, at a time when it was perhaps, dare I say it, in its more reactionary phase, but they were also uh, uh, pragmatics rather than doctrinaires. I would like to think that if uh, Scott had lived, as he might well have done, like Wellington for another 20 years, it would be very interesting to see his take on, on events. However, we are all very, very grateful to Stephen Woolman for his wonderful talk, and I would ask you to give him a very hearty vote of thanks. <laughs> uh, Stephen, to go with that vote of thanks, may I give you a club tie? which I hope you may feel constrained to wear occasionally, and a little book uh, that gathers together some extracts from the speeches of thank past presidents much. at the annual dinner. Thank you very much. And thank you again for a marvellous uh, speech. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the next time uh, we shall be together will be on Sunday the 16th